Some stories are timeless, and not always for the best reasons. The catastrophic nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl is one such story, the effects to be felt for many, many generations to come. Next year will mark 30 years since the worst nuclear accident in history. And still, the Chernobyl plant and surrounding areas remain off limits, highly radioactive and very dangerous. For the 20th anniversary, Richard Carlton gained rare access to Chernobyl, a glimpse into the belly of the beast, into the heart of the nuclear reactor. Exactly what caused the Chernobyl nuclear reactor to explode, we don't yet know. The level of radiation at this point reached 2,000 per hour. How many people are doomed eventually to fall victim to Chernobyl, we will never know. The dust continued to drift, polluting the air and the land. Helicopters attempted to decontaminate the air. Ever wondered what the world might be like 20 years after a nuclear war? Well, something like this is my best guess. Welcome to Sunny Town, Belarus. That's its name, Sunny Town. Chernobyl is about 10 or 15 kilometres over there across the river. None of this is blast damage. There is some vandalism here, but this place is just so radioactive, it's uninhabitable. We've been allowed just one hour to film here today before we must get out. Thousands of people lived in Sunnytown. Then one day in April 1986, soldiers arrived and ordered everyone to leave. Just for a couple of days, the residents were told. But 20 years later, none have ever been back. It's tempting. It actually smells nice. But everything that grows here is forbidden fruit, poisonous for a thousand years. But amazingly, here, just 200 metres from ground zero, the very epicentre of the disaster, it's relatively safe. Have a look at this metre. I'd have to stand here for the best part of 40 hours to get the radiation effect of one chest x-ray. Go 100 metres closer though, and I'd have to stand only five or six hours to get the radiation effect of one chest x-ray. But after that, it goes like that, until you get to some of the hot spots inside where you're getting the equivalent of 30 chest x-rays a second. And at that rate, in a bit over five minutes, you're fried. So how can I be safe here when villages 10, 20, even 150 kilometres away are no-go areas? To answer that, we have to go back to that day in April 1986, to the control room of reactor number four, where a handful of barely qualified technicians are trying to figure out what will happen if they turn down the power levels. They're trying to work out a way of keeping the turbine spinning as the nuclear reactor went offline. And in this case, they produced a low power level that uh, went dramatically unstable. Australian so, scientist Professor uh, Ian Lowe recalls that disastrous and, uh, experiment. In the process, they breached no fewer than six specific safety guidelines uh, and managed to produce a catastrophic explosion. We're talking about a structure that's equivalent to the, the size of the Telstra Stadium or the MCG to a height of 70 metres with a reinforced concrete roof and the roof was lifted off and uh, finished up uh, you know, collapsing sideways down into the structure. The fire raged for days. Helicopter crews flew suicide missions over the smoking ruins trying to blanket the flames and fumes with sand. Completely unprepared for anything like it, the Soviets sent in teams of men, human sacrifices actually, to clean up the radioactive mess. These bio-robots could work for just a few minutes at a time before running for their lives. The blast threw radioactive debris and dust to 50,000 feet. 
One reason it's relatively safe here is this whole area, roads, footpath, grass, everything, down to a depth of a metre and a half, has been dug up and replaced with fresh stuff. Another reason is a huge concrete shell has been built over the top of the destroyed reactor. It took six months and 300,000 workers to build this sarcophagus, a giant tomb of steel and concrete, designed to seal in tons and tons of nuclear fuel, now mixed with once molten rock, that runs like a frozen black river through the heart of the ruins. At least 2,000 of these workers, known as the liquidators, will eventually die from the effects of radiation they absorb. Today, Chernobyl is surrounded by a 30-kilometre exclusion zone guarded by militia. OK. These are the nearby black villages. 350,000 people were uprooted from their homes. Here, a graveyard for the thousands of contaminated vehicles used in the cleanup. Trucks, helicopters, buses, fire engines. And then emerging from the undergrowth, a city. Well, you know, this is quite obviously a library, but where are we? So actually we are in the town of Pripyat. Uh, which is only three kilometres away from the nuclear power plant. And Rima Kisilitsa is one of the guardians of a ghost city, Pripyat, uh, uh, built to house 50,000 workers from Chernobyl and once the pride of the Soviet Union. On that morning in April 20 years ago, the people of Pripyat were preparing for their May Day holiday. It was not until two days after the accident that they were eventually evacuated. Have a look how nature is taking over. Yeah. It was a nice uh, square at that time with roses growing here and now you see these poplar trees are growing right through the asphalt. A few villagers have sneaked back into the forbidden zone because they have nothing outside. In one village, we came upon an old woman mourning her husband. He had died just two days before of heart failure, we were told, not cancer. The number of casualties from Chernobyl is still hotly debated. Somewhere between 4,000 and 24,000 people will eventually die as a result of the radiation from the accident. But in Belarus, the country most affected by the fallout, doctors say the human cost of Chernobyl is still being counted. You can see his head is very big. The size of his head is very big and there is water in his brain. And so, and um, his prognosis uh, is not very good. Not In the wards of the Gomel Children's Hospital, Dr. Irina Kalmanovich says she has observed a sharp increase in the number of premature births since Chernobyl. Our scientists uh, uh, have opinion uh, that prematurity born children is um, effects of Chernobyl. At the epicentre of the disaster, scientists have begun to notice something worrying. The sarcophagus, so hurriedly thrown together at the time, is now leaking. There are more than 100 square metres of holes and cracks in the shell, letting radiation out and rainwater in. Look, the roof is unstable. What happens if, God forbid, it collapses? 
So in that case, uh, all these radioactive dust which is accumulated inside the shelter facility will be spread uh, on the territory of the 30 kilometer exclusion zone. Just 30 kilometers? Just 30 kilometers. Why are you so confident about that? That's because I was told. Oh. <laughs> Some nuclear scientists aren't so sure. This is part of the reactor core as it lies now, all 3,000 tonnes of it, and it should be like that. The roof here is made of one and a half mil steel plate. That's not much thicker than a thumbnail. And it just sits there. It's not even tack welded in place. They couldn't use anything thicker for fear that the weight would cause the whole structure to collapse. After 20 years, it's starting to rust through. Over here is the control room that set it all off. Now, the authorities have said we can go in there for just a few seconds. A handful of Ukrainian scientists work inside the sarcophagus, but it's rare for an outsider to be allowed in. Well, we are going to the shift supervisor room. And not a little daunting. And what are these two meters doing? Well, uh, the, uh, these uh, dosimeters, they measure the dose which you get inside during our visit. Part of the control room now. It's only a five minute walk to the point where it all unraveled yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah. Oh, we're here. We are here, yes. That is the room where the operating personnel worked and they operated the reactor from that very room. From here? From here, yes. Where was the man sitting who was responsible? In front of these control panels. Twenty years ago, 1.23 in the morning, the day after Anzac Day, the man sitting at one of these panels here pushed one of these buttons and set off the worst nuclear disaster the world has ever seen. This is an extraordinary place to be. It is truly a moment frozen in time. You think about the man and his mistake, but also remember that he stuck to his post for hours trying to shut down the reactor core. He knew the price of staying, and sure enough, Within days of the accident, he was dead. And then our few minutes were up. Julia, how much time have we left? Uh, well, Richard, it's better to go. OK. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.